In a previous video, I explained how you actually do a gauge R&R or repeatability and reproducibility study. But what I noticed is that the what we are actually doing and what basically how it works, so not what you put into Excel, but what the calculations are trying to solve for, is not as well understood. Thanks to Nicolette for pointing it out in a comment. And I also saw that with other videos, with other websites, the same question keeps popping up. So let's make a video about what you are actually doing when performing a gauge R&R study. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today's video is again about gauge R&R, but where in my previous video I discussed why we do it, a little bit of what we do and then a lot of how we do it, let's talk about what is repeatability, what is reproducibility, uh, where do these numbers come from? What are you actually doing when you are sampling three times or when you take 10 or 15 samples? So what are the choices you make based on what is the statistical process giving us? Now, if you just want to know how to do a gauge r, &R go click that link and watch the other video. But if you are also interested in the concepts behind it, stay tuned. We'll explain it today. Now, the first very important concept is that no measurement system is accurate 100% of the time. That's the whole reason why we check accuracy, precision, and why we do these r, &R studies in the first place. But I noticed that, especially to people who are new to engineering and statistics, this is a real serious first hurdle to take. And that may have to do with weighing measurements, so scales usually being pretty accurate. But even with scales, the secret is that usually we already picked the correct type of scales and accuracy for the application. This one, for instance, can measure, well, people, and it can measure up to 180 kilos, but with its 100 gram precision, it's not very suitable to measure, let's say, a bit of flour or other things I need in a kitchen recipe, where we have the small scales, but if I would stand on this one, I would break it. So we already put the correct measuring device and also the strength and accuracy and precision into most of the applications we have. But if we look a little bit further, I also found this wonderful thing. This is a, uh, it's a measuring cup, of course, um, but it can measure cups, milliliters, uh, so volume, but it also includes a scales in it. So this one I can uh, use to do all my kitchen measuring as well. So uh, my flour, my eggs, um, but as you probably know, there are also many measuring cups that have a so many grams of flour or sugar or water scale on the side. So they are using volume and density to measure weight. And these, you probably also noticed, are a lot less precise. Now, is this a problem in the kitchen? Usually not, but it can definitely be a problem when you are doing this in an industrial setting with, for instance, flow meters instead of a big weighing balance. And we get into much more measuring variability when the thing that we're trying to measure is difficult. Like for instance, the wall behind me is white, but with one camera, with my video lights, let's check a bit what it does if I put the white balance on slightly different places here. So basically you would say it is exactly the same equipment, it is the same lighting, it is definitely the same wall in all of these shots, but it has been changing a lot, hasn't it? So the same sample, with the same device gives a different result in measurement. And now the question becomes, how important is this in the overall variation that we have in our process? And then a secondary question will be, does it fit within our specification limits? So using the wrong measurement equipment or using it wrong or simply having a lot of variation in your measurement system can lead to measurement errors. What gauge r, &R tries to measure are basically three things with the first being what part of the total variation we see in the process comes from variation due to the measurement device. And this is basically this percentage at the end that you see, and you'll probably remember less than 10% world-class, 10 to 30% acceptable, more than 30% not acceptable. What it means is that at least 70% of the observed variation should be the process itself. And actually it would be even better if it's more than 90% of the variation we see comes from the process itself. Now, in general, we of course do not want a lot of variability in our process. If we are going to Six Sigma our processes, we reduce the variability, but it is important 
that the variability increase due to the measurement system be even smaller. Because if our measurement makes a lot of the variability we see, then it doesn't really tell us what the process is doing. It becomes just a lottery. And that is the last thing we need for Six Sigma. Now the second and third question, they actually break up the total gauge variability into what part comes from my equipment. So really from the measurement system itself and what part of the variation is due to different people using it in a different way or maybe reading the equipment in a different way. So this is what we call assessor variance or operator or laboratory staff. Th this is the difference people enter into the measurement system. And this, of course, we also see back in how we set up a gauge r, &R study. Because to see what variation we get due to the equipment, so really the measurement device itself, we measure the same sample a couple of times. And you see we get slightly different results. And when we take the highest minus the lowest, we get the range between repeated measurements of the same sample. Now, when we go over one operator and we check a number of different parts, but each of those parts has a range, we can see how much spread on average is there in this measurement. You see, when we have the same operator using the same machine, just all at one time, you have the ideal circumstances for your measuring system. So any variation we still see at this moment is due to the equipment. Now in the calculation, you see that we take the average of the ranges of all the samples from all the operators, but we are still taking averages only of the repeated measurements of the same sample. We're just taking a big sample of such ranges. So the effect between operators does not play a role here yet, as we just average it. And then you see that we divide this average range by a D2 value. And what this actually tries to do is to estimate the standard deviation in your equipment variability. Now let's take a look at that D2 table. The values themselves, just accept them also for yourself, download a D2 table, look it up on Google. They are just constants for getting a range into a standard deviation with different sample sizes and repetitions. Now, what do we see for our equipment variation is that when the M increases, that means when we have more repetitions, the number goes up. And this is, if you test more things, the chance that they are pretty far apart, the highest and the lowest, of course, becomes greater. If we test, like in our example, only two samples, they will probably be picked somewhere in the middle of our distribution, or maybe one in the middle, one to one side. The chance of having one very low one, one very high one, is rather slim. So you divide by a relatively small number. Now, when you take lots of repetitions, then probably you will get a pretty low and a pretty high one. So to correct for this, the number by which you divide becomes bigger. And we see that this G value is the number of parts that we have times the number of operators. Or in other words, the G value is how often did we measure one of the parts M times. Now you see that the D2 number decreases as we increase the number of operators or parts. And this is because we average the range that we get. And in our example, we averaged 30 measurements of a part because we have 10 parts and three operators. So there were 30 trials of getting a number of repetitions on one individual part. You see, when you average lots and lots of measured ranges, you get closer to the actual average range of your distribution. If we assume that we have a nice normal distribution, then we can also know that within a normal distribution, the average range of two randomly drawn points is this 1.128. And that's the one you will see at two point of repetition in the more than 15 row. Now these numbers do take into account how often you repeated the tests and how many of the tests you did, but it is still better to, to have a large sample size with a larger number of repetitions. 
because the more analysis you do, the less your result will be up to pure charts. That is, the more tests you perform, the closer you will get to your real distribution of the measurement variability. Then we test for reproducibility. So can another operator reproduce the same results the first one did? Now you can imagine that if you have multiple operators repeating more tests, then your total variation will go up even if the operators perform wonderful, but simply doing more tests means that the chance of getting a couple of outliers also increases. The formula will take this into account because what it does is it checks the range between the averages of the different operators for, of course, the same parts. Now, in an ideal world, these averages would, of course, be the same because they are measuring the same parts, but we already know that due to equipment variability, there it will be some difference there. And what we check with the formula is, is the difference between the operators greater than we would statistically expect just because of equipment variation? The reproducibility factor with this calculation can be zero because of some chance the difference between the operators is in fact less than you would expect purely based on equipment variability. This is just normal statistics and you happen to have drawn some operators who are very close to the center line. Now, when this happens, the formula simply says there is no added variability due to the operator effect. But when we see that the difference between the operators is relatively big and is bigger than what we expect purely based on random chance because of the equipment, then we say, aha, there is also part of the total variation that is because of how the operators use the devices. And this is then the operator variability or reproducibility. We cannot 100% reproduce the same results when we use a different machine or different operator or vastly different times. Now again, there is a D2 value. But in this case, you see that the G is always one. And this is because there is only one result per operator. We take the average of the values he found, but because we take this average and there is no ranging in here, there is just a single result for each operator. And the M is the number of operators. As you can imagine that when we take more operators, the chances of having a bigger range between the lowest and highest value goes up. So these two calculations will answer questions two and three. And then when we combine those effects, we get the total gauge repeatability and reproducibility. Now you will see that to add them up, we square them and then take the square root again. This is because we are not directly working with the variation here, but with the sigma or standard deviation. And this is a square root of your variation. It's just a bit of maths that we will have to accept. You cannot add up standard deviations. You can only add up the variances to get to a total variation. And then, to say something about is the observed R&R good or bad for our process, we of course also need to know what is the variation within the entire process. And that's what we will calculate next. And here what you will see is that we take all the trials by different operators for the same part, we average it out, and then we get an average measurement over all the trials by all the operators for each part. In our case, we have 10 of these averages and we check what is the highest and what is the lowest part value. And by taking this, we get the best estimate for each of the parts, and then we can take the range of those parts. And to make this calculation, we will basically use the same trick we've been doing before, and that's to take a D2 value to go from the observed range to an estimated total standard deviation. And again, the more trials you have, or in this case, the more different parts you have each operator measure, the higher the chances will be that you have and a very small and a very large part. You see, our entire process just has one big distribution of the values. The more randomly picked samples we take from there, the higher our range will be. So that's also why when the M increases in our D2 table, we get a higher D2 to correct for this phenomena. Now you add this part-to-part -part variation again by squaring and then taking square root 
to the gauge INR to get your total variation. And that then you use to divide your RNR by the total variation and you get a percentage of how much of the total variation is due to the measurement system. Now this way of calculating has a very important consequence for how you should set up your RNR study and that is we assume that these parts show us the total range of our process. So make sure that you really have random samples throughout your production and if you go to the line and you just pick up 10 samples within a very short interval you are almost guaranteed to not have the total range within your process. So go to different shifts, different days, make sure that you get all the variability that is in your process because otherwise you will be underestimating the total process variation and then you will too easily say my measurement system is not good because you are dividing by too small a number. Now the other way of checking if our gauge R&R is okay or not for the process is to compare it to the specification limits. The good thing about it is that this doesn't rely on you picking a random sample in your production. The bad thing about it is that we tend to set specification limits just a bit like we like it. And it is generally better to pick your measurement devices really based on the process itself and not so much on how your sales department would have liked your process to behave. But that being said, it can really be useful so we take the higher specification limit and the lower specification limit and this gives us a range of our specification. And you will probably know that when we're working with standard deviations there is no limit to minimum maximum anymore. We work with so many standard deviations it gives us this percentage of the total population. And the percentage we take here is 99.0 and 99.0 percent of the distribution is in 5.15 times your standard deviation. So that's where the 5.15 in this formula comes from. What we do is we take the total specification range as our divider and the denominator is our observed RNR. This is a, a sigma, a standard deviation, times 5.15. So this 99% of the spread that our measurement system is going to give divided by the specification limits, the range of the specification limits. So we compare our total measurement system variability both to what we see in this RNR test and to what we have as a specification range. If you really make a good sample of the process variation throughout your entire process, that first method is generally recommended. If you use the ANOVA method, this is actually also the only one you will get. So make sure again you get this whole spread of your production but it can also be really useful to check how well is this compared to my specification limits because sometimes you just have nothing to worry about because you have a very broad specification bandwidth. So I hope you got a better understanding for the concepts behind an R&R study and I know at least for me it's always easier to apply formulas when I know what they're trying to do and what I am actually doing when using the statistics. Now if you like this video don't forget to hit that like button but also please drop me a comment telling me why did you watch this video. Perhaps you have a green belt training or a project coming up, formal education, just brushing up your knowledge. Let me know in the comments down below. And whatever your reasons are for brushing up your Six Sigma knowledge I wish you the best of luck in your projects and as always enjoy your continuous improvement journey.